Hey, what's up? This is Sully from Godsmack. Strap on those boots, baby, because you are now in the trenches of the war room with the one and only Mistress Carrie right here on the Mistress Carrie podcast. What's up? This is Joe Rogan, and you're listening to Mistress Carrie. I have so lovely pretty eyes. Hey, this is Brent from Shinedown, and you're listening to Mistress Carrie. Hey, Carrie, go put your brow on, girl. Hey, this is Steven Tyler, and you'll be listening to the baddest bitch in Boston, Mistress Carrie. What's up? This is Aaron from Stan. And you're listening to Mistress Carrie. Hi, everybody. This is Dave Grohl from the Foo Fighters, and you're listening to the one, the only, Mistress Carrie. Hey, this is David from the band Disturbed, and you're listening to the baddest bitch in Boston, Mistress Carrie. Hi, Bruce Dickinson here from Iron Maiden. Yes, indeed. Miss Whiplash herself, Mrs. Carrie, is here to um, unchain your brain. Hi, this is Flea from the Red Hot Chili Peppers, and you're listening to Mistress Carrie. This is Dennis Leary. You are listening to my favorite, Mistress Carrie. Hey, this is Corey from Stone Sour, and you're listening to. You have the privilege of listening to Mr. Scary. Oh, God. Oh, yeah. Hey, it's Mistress Carrie reporting for duty from MCHQ for episode 165 of the Mistress Carrie podcast. And before we get to this week's guest, Joachim Jolly Carlson from Bad Omens, I want to remind you about everything you can find at mistresscarrie.com. Not only can you find every episode of the Mistress Carrie podcast, but you'll find every episode of my video show, Cocktails in the War Room. You can check out my blog, shop in the online Mistress Carrie store, and check out the event calendar that's filled with concerts and events happening all over New England. And that includes Bad Omens at Roadrunner coming up on September 16th. You'll find the link to that show in the show notes of this episode. Jolly from Bad Omens is the guitar player in the band who has lived in L.A. for the last seven years after immigrating from Sweden to join the band. Bad Omens were taking a little bit of a break at home to start writing a new album, and I caught up with Jolly to talk to him about their latest album, The Death of Peace of Mind, the band's upcoming tour, his musical influences, his love of Slipknot, his passion for true crime podcast. We talked about aliens, learning how to play the guitar, songwriting, the influence of ACDC, the band stage production, the metric system, why Americans love Halloween so much, and so much more. Check out the show notes of this episode, not only to get tickets to see Bad Omens at Roadrunner, but also to listen to this episode's corresponding playlist, which features a ton of Bad Omens music. So, allow me to introduce you to Joachim Jolly Carlson from Bad Omens. Hello. How are you? Hello. Well, I am great. How are you doing? I'm really good. Thanks for doing this. Well, I first got to ask you, what do you prefer, Joachim or Jolly? Uh, Jolly, 100%. Joachim is just when I'm in trouble. Oh, <laughs> is that how it is? No, it's just that uh, Jolly is definitely the, 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 the name that everybody really here uh, calls me by. And then the, my real name is just, you know, if someone reads it off of a paper or my mother calls me. Doesn't I was going to say, unless, say it in the Swedish unless accent, your rather, mom's yeah. mad at you, right? Yeah, no, she, she calls me by my name all the time. Though, so I, doesn't, I don't have to be, doesn't have to be mad at me. She doesn't say Jolly. She doesn't? She doesn't like the nicknames? I, I don't know. It's just one of those things. I think, like, as a parent, you just call them whatever the fuck you name them. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It does seem to be, like, one of the hardest decisions you make in life is naming another person. Um, yeah, because it doesn't really matter what you name them. They're still going to hate it, man, right? <laughs> and, like, you always grow up hating your own name. I think you kind of grow in and out of that, though, because I hated it. And then I was like, you know what? It's not that bad. And then today I was like, I kind of like it. It's like, it's me. I've grown into it. Like, I don't want to change my name or anything. But then, I, like I said, I kind of go by Jolly and it's kind of, it's definitely not un- completely unique, but I don't know any other one that's Jolly. So it's very easy to, to know who uh, who people are talking and referring to most of the time. It's kind of like Mistress Carrie too. It's like my mom, yeah, I, I bet. my mom didn't call me that, but it's been my name for over <laughs> 25 years. And so I'm just so used to it now. Yeah. But when someone calls me Carrie or Carrie Ann, that's how I know when I'm in trouble. Oh, Carrie Ann. Yeah, it, Carrie Ann. They bust oh, out the middle name. Look out. You know you did something <laughs> wrong. Oh. 
Well, the first thing I wanted to do is say congratulations because you guys just got certified gold this week. We did. Yeah, I got that uh, information like a day ago or something. That's cool. How has it been for you dealing with this new level of kind of fame with the band? Because it seems like you guys are everywhere right now. Uh, Yeah, um, very chill, honestly. We're very laid back dudes, uh, most of us. And like, we don't really like to... um, I mean, I don't know. I feel like it's it has not much have changed because we've been doing this for a long time. Like, you know, this doesn't happen overnight. It's just there's a lot of people started maybe listening to us overnight or like over a year at least. It feels like one at this last last year has really we've exploded during it, it felt like. Um so uh I know it's it's interesting. It's a very interesting position to be in, but like I said, we've been doing it for so long. And even like in seven years ago. I was playing shows that were big. We were just the opener then, you know, and we were still playing for, you know, uh, like Parkway Drive and, and whatnot. And then I like, had cool big shows. And then the the difference now is obviously that you're on top now. You're, you're play last. You have to play the long set. You can't just go up and rock 25 minutes anymore. You got to do the full hour, 15 hour, 20, whatever you're doing. And, but it's way more fun because you are also in charge of your own show. Like you can invest however much money you want in your production. And that's what we're trying to do. Make it really big and buff. And, you know, so it's fun. You just, and it's more fun up there. So that's also another difference. Now you stand up there and uh, you feel like somebody, <laughs> you feel like someone on there. Well, it takes a lifetime to become an overnight success. So you're just reaping the yeah, benefits right, of all the hard work now. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of hard work laying forward as well. Like we, we just, um, like I said, we've been touring for forever, and all this success came when we were touring. So it's just nothing really changed. You just, you know, a lot of more people came out, and obviously we we understood that and all that. We just kind of kept our cool about it, and we were always like the show first. We we're always like just keep your head, try to make a really good show for everyone, because you know these shows are actually sold out. We wanted them to leave thinking like, holy fuck, like there's a reason why they're these shows are selling out. And like, you know, created the band even more. So it's always like go up and do the next day, like better than you did the last sort of thinking. And uh, I don't know. And like I said, uh, we are off now for like the first time in I think a year and a half or almost two years. I don't really know. Um, we're off for more than just one month. Uh, so because usually you tour and you come home and you only have a month off, you, you kind of relax a little bit. Like you, you do the stuff at home. You see the you see friends, you do normal people stuff. And then you go back out again and it's like, right, now we're home for three months and we finally get to sit and like try to uh, work on some new music. And, uh, you know, that's a, another full-time gig essentially. So we're uh, we're trying to do as much as possible of that before we roll out again on tour. So uh, the first thing I usually, the first thing I usually ask bands is, is where they are. Cause half the time you guys don't mm-hmm. even know, cause you're traveling so much. So you're home mm-hmm. right now. Yes. Where is home I mean, now? Uh, home is in in uh, California in LA. Yeah, I like I've been lived here ever since the band started. I've lived in America, so I'm from Sweden. My roots are in Sweden, and like I used to tour in a band from Sweden and all that stuff. But uh, ever since Bad Omen went out of the gates, I've been living uh, in America. What is it about that part of the world? Because there's so much rock and metal music <laughs> that comes out of that. Scandinavian uh, part of the world, like, what is it about rock music that has such a such a foothold there? I don't know. You can see, you can see that about rock music, absolutely. But you can hundred percent say that about pop music as well. We have you know Max Martin coming out of. We have a lot of producers coming out of there, making very big history here on the radio every day. And I really don't. I can't. I can't put my foot on it. What was like? Why is like it's it's not probably not just Swedish. It's probably like Norwegian or like Danish, like the Scandinavian like songwriting in general. And I don't really know. I actually don't know, but I can agree like there's a lot of good metal coming from there. I really like the Gothenburg sound within Flames. I grew up with that, and uh, there are a lot of cool bands like Soil Work and you know Meshuggah. And uh, Sweden does have a lot of really really cool bands. Is that what you were listening to growing up? Because I'm always mm-hmm. really curious about. I have a theory, tell me if this is how it was for you, that there's two okay. phases of your musical development. There's the music you get passively exposed to, the soundtrack of your childhood. And yeah. then you wake up one day and you hear something and you go, no, wait, I like that, that's mine. So what was the soundtrack to your childhood growing up in Sweden? And then what was the uh, first yeah. thing that you said, oh, wait, no, okay, this is what I like? 
<laughs> yeah, well, well, lucky. I still like the soundtrack of because, it's, like you said, that's just what you get, get exposed to. What are your parents playing? Like you know what that you hear. <laughs> And my dad really liked, you know, old rock and he liked, I think the heaviest that he listened to is like Metallica, but he liked stuff like ACDC and CZ Top and Billy Idol. And that's stuff I, I remember hearing, especially like a Friday, Fridays. Like that's how I could determine it was a Friday because Billy Idol was playing Rebel Yell, you know? I was like, <laughs> oh, it's like weekend coming up. And like, you know, dad was in a better mood and smelled good because he had perfume on or, whatever, or cologne on or whatever. So you're like, oh shit, okay. So like I re- I, re- I remember that like as soon as it's because you don't you don't really play that during the weekdays at home you know he's just you know normal and then like on the weekends you turn on the music and you 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 pop the beer and drink the wine and make the music and whatnot so I always knew it was a better vibe of weekends than that music was playing but yeah and then uh, that took a change probably when I heard like something like probably like Slipknot that uh, brought me to the little heavier stuff I really liked Metallica for a long time and some other like speed metal and stuff like you know just the heavier the better and then you find slip on they're obviously kind of the the heaviest of them then and then you started hearing people and then it just became a battle of what was heaviest and that became boring so um slip on is still but amongst like the uh, bands they'll still listen to it's crazy mm-hmm. that they've been around so long now yeah that they're really going to be eligible for induction into the rock and roll hall of fame and and bordering on the definition of classic rock that there's What's a the limit for that. It's a 20, 25 30, what years, is it? 25 Holy years shit. from the date of your first release. So Slipknot's knocking uh-huh. at the door, which is nuts. Yeah, it's cool. They're, they're really cool. They've been, and they've been relevant the whole time. Ever since they blew up or became big, they've always been, you know, they created a, a, a legacy band uh, like instantly almost. So that's really cool. And they're still releasing cool music. And there's a whole generation of metal bands that they help to inspire, which is what 100%. I'm talking about with you. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We draw like, oh, shit, man. Back in the day, like with the first Bad Omens songs, like a lot of it was just straight, you know, Iowa, Iowa, Slipknot. Um, um, it was really, really heavy, really just like kind of ripped off almost from Slipknot. It was really cool. A little different vocals and whatnot. So yeah, they they played a huge part in, in, in what we did. And then we kind of just, now I feel like we're easing our way out of all the heaviness and rather just kind of like to create whatever that we want to. And I really don't listen to have a lot of heavy music in the, in, in, in um, you know, my, my free time. I actually listen to a lot of podcasts in my free time. So that, that's what I usually do. I always like try to absorb knowledge or just have be a fly on the wall in conversations rather than listening to music, uh, which is kind of weird because, you know, I need inspiration and whatnot. But I feel like that's also how I keep uh, songwriting a little bit. Un- uh, I don't know how to say it. I'm fucked with. Like, I really don't listen to that much. What comes is just kind of what's in here and what other people like uh, Noah, whatever has exposed me to, what he's listening to in the moment. Maybe I'll listen to some of that to, to get in the right space of writing and whatnot. But I don't have like a favorite band that I try to like frame anything from. It's just, you know, we just try to create cool shit all the time, which is, it makes it kind of difficult writing because we are trying to reinvent ourselves all the time. So it's like, okay, no, we can't do that because we've already done that. It's great. Let's do something different. And you sit and make the same song for four days, you know? Well, it's, it would be like me sitting around just listening to the radio all the time. It just, you don't <laughs> yeah. want to, you don't want to take your, your work home with you, but as a podcaster as well, uh, what are some podcasts that you really like? Because most people find mm-hmm. podcasts because other people recommend them. So what are you listening to that yeah. you really like? Well, it depends on what you want. It, it, like I like uh, true crime some, sometimes. So there's like these there's these girls called Morbid, I think. And there's these two girls that are talking and then there's, um, they're pretty cool. If you just search true crime, there's probably so much good. And I also like all that conspiracy theories, you know, about aliens and all that stuff. I like to listen to that and like, what's a new update? Like, let me hear about another crash somewhere or something uh, and like that. And I like Joe Rogan. Uh, he has so many interesting guests and a very, a lot of them are like scientists, you know, and so you, you really sit in there and he's talking to like some of the very smartest people. So it's very cool to like to be a fly on that wall and be like, okay, let's try to absorb some of it. Um, so yeah, it's a lot of that. And then when I'm not doing that, I guess like video games and reading books and when I'm not writing music, you know. Can we talk about your musical upbringing? Because mm-hmm. it, it fascinates me and the more people that I talk to, the more guitar players that I talk to, there just seems to be these people that are able to kind of pick it up and they're not intimidated by it 
and they just pick it up and either kind of inherently know how to play it or very easily learn how to play it. And then there's people like me that just look at it and they're like, yeah, I don't even understand how it works. And yeah. so were you predisposed to it? Did you get gifted no. musical ability by other musicians <laughs> in the family or what inspired you to no. start playing? Uh, my parents and my brother, um, no, none of them are musically talented at all, but they are musically they were interested and they were, they were uh, I guess, uh, kind of glad that I was interested in music because when I was small, I was banging on pop and ledge with actual drumsticks that my dad got from like his friend that was in a band. So he procured like real drumsticks for me, which was cool for me. I don't know what at the age, four, five, six, you know, uh, pots and pans in the kitchen. So I think I was a drummer at first at heart and I really was really into that. And I told them like one Christmas, like took them down to the basement and like, you know, see right there, that's where the drum set goes, right? <laughs> And they were like, okay, we got to do something about this uh, urge. Yeah. So um, they uh, straight up went out and bought a guitar, <laughs> which was so fucking smart. Um, you know, because you just, you just like relieve yourself of years of just noise. You can't do shit because it just covers the whole house with noise. So I got a guitar and I was like, as soon as I saw that, I was like so stoked. So I didn't care at all. But no, picking it up, I had no idea what that thing was. I was not even using my left hand. I was like trying to make notes with the right hand strumming it up the neck you know i have no idea how to play guitar but uh you ca caught it up really like um slowly and then they enrolled me in some classes and i think it takes to like when you first learn something that you are stoked about like it could be anything it could be the deep purple freaking smoke on the water riff or and maybe like if it's something more um, uh, harder or trickier like some metallica riff or something the first time you do that and you're like i play that like i think that's where you like the decision is made like how do you feel about that do, did that flow your boat? And you're like, now, nah, then you probably won't do it again. But if people will get really stoked and continue to learn riffs and like, that's just how you get better. You gotta, you gotta be excited about it. You can't get forced into it. Like, Oh, like my dad is forcing me to take guitar lessons. Like, I don't think that's going to create your interest in it. I think you're going to drop that as soon as he let you, you know? So it's better to just like let the, and, and I was just obviously prone to like, I really liked it. I thought it was cool. It was I thought it was really cool. My dad had some friends that play guitar that were, that were like all cool. And I get to hold like a real Gibson and play through a real amp when I was really young. And that just, I think that just um, made me like more and like, I really liked this. So I was like, uh, even if I didn't know how to play, I, re I really knew that I liked it. And then as soon as I started learning how to play a little bit, it just took from there. But uh, I've never really, really been great at guitar because I, the best I was ever at guitar was in high school because that's when like it mattered. I, I enrolled in like a, a music high school to the other like-minded people finally because all of my people growing up it was kind of like sports guys and I was too so I was doing all the sports with them but I also liked guitar because I was the nerd with the guitar as well or like rock music rather than other stuff rather than Backstreet Boys I liked you know I see Deezy <laughs> um uh shit what was I talking about I always forget my trail we were we were talking about you learning how to play the guitar. Yes. Yeah. And uh, yeah, and then I went to that music high school. And that's where other people were very like, there are very good people in there that were very yeah. talented. And you realized like, shit, I got to actually put the work in. And then I started learning like, you know, some Malms, Ingvi Malmsteen stuff or like real scarce. Yeah, look how fast I can tread. And like, that was really fun when you started learning that as well. Like you got into that, you passed the threshold. We're like, oh, it's going fast now. And I'm actually striking everything in this school. But I dropped that pretty, like, so after high school, I was just like, this isn't fun. Like, I want to make songs. Like, I, I, I'm i like, I'm a songwriter, rather. Like, I, I want to make this song. It doesn't have to be just guitar. It could be no guitar today. I don't give a, I don't give a fuck. I want to make this song. And, you know, and I'm way more interested in, like, the creation of that and the elements that goes in there and, you know, the ambience and what chord goes where. This riff needs to be simple, not too complicated. Everybody needs to remember it. I want everybody to be able to play it, but it can't be too simple. Like, you know just like normal stuff. And I, that's just more interest to me than, you know, being the fastest, most uh, shreddy guitar player. Uh, I make sure that I play our music pretty good. Though. I do I do practice a lot to make sure that I go up to play really good. Just sometimes it's a little tricky, but um, we have pretty simple music. It's uh, nothing crazy. What was the riff that, that won you over when you first started playing? Was it Smoke on the Water? Uh, what was the first no. guitar riff that you actually played it right and were like, okay, I'm figuring this out. I think I said that um, on another interview. I think it was, and I can't be sure, but I think it was Riff Raff with ACDC. 
Do you know how that riff goes? Yeah. It's like down, 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 ba, da, 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 da. and then you got up in speed a little bit there, and I was like, that was fun. Um, I think it was that was the first riff, but I was like, this is this is so much fun. We're talking about influence of Slipknot. It's uh-huh. it's impossible to measure the influence of ACDC. Every band yeah. I talk to has some favorite Angus riff, <laughs> or they're talking about Malcolm's rhythm ability. Or they're just talking yeah. about the brilliance of the songwriting and how iconic the music is. It, uh, it, rock and roll would be so different without the Young Brothers. Oh my God! Yeah, and they're still doing it um, to this day. They're they're just they're just crazy. They're, but I mean, yeah, they're just born to do it, and they would probably not have it any other way. They're just it's, and it's so cool to see. And they, yeah, they've shaped me. I definitely know because. I love their stage, uh, like how they run a stage is something that I think is super cool. They're like kind of stationary, you know, and the only one that really runs around is Angus. He's like, I, I can go whatever I want, you know, and then, uh, but then they have like the basis of Malcolm, whatever, when he uses, when he was in the man, God rest his soul. Um, he, uh, and they will stand like a little farther back. And when their vocal parts come up, they'll like walk up and, and synchronize and they'll like knock out their lines and then they'll go back again. And then it'll just look cool as fuck with their hair down and just big ass guitars and like their whole stage like just looks rock and roll shit. And I feel like we have a little bit of that, a little bit of that in our going on. Uh, just like we like to have our little uh, our like our locations and where we know where we looks cool and how it looks cool when we look in a certain way. And like I definitely don't swing my guitar around my freaking neck and do anything crazy anymore. I just there's so much light going on. I like to focus on playing. And I, I know that it's going to look cool because we catered the show to have the lights look, you know, a certain way. And I like to be able to play because I have hair and I sometimes you can't see and I have to freaking focus. But <laughs> I do feel like sometimes when I'm just in my normal song, rhythm song, I'm not having like any vocal parts or anything. I'm just like kind of, you know, moving my head. I definitely do it. Not like Angus Jung, uh, my, my, just his default, which is like two foot forward and two back. I find myself in that exact group a lot of the time. That, comes solely from watching a lot of live videos growing up like live acdc concerts and stuff like just i just knew how that guy moved and when you don't know like i guess what one point at back you just really well how, how should i how should i move and then you just realize that's how you're moving and then seven years later that's just how i move now i just like groove like him a little bit that's just solely from him before i was on the radio i was a lighting tech for years and I, I was on the lighting crew for ACDC and they were handing out the oh. jobs. And when you got the spotlight job for Angus, it was like, oh, because you knew you weren't going to stop moving all yeah. night, just chasing that guy around the stage. He doesn't oh, stop. God. Did you do it? Yeah. Did you get that job? Yeah. The spotlight job for Angus. Oh, hey, that's awesome. Yeah. So how do you move those? Are they like heavy or are they automated? They're, like- they're on a, they're on a, a like a, um like a, a pole and it's, and it's balanced. Yeah. So it okay. just kind of tips and it's all leverage and, and so you do get help. You don't have to like, yeah, no, like no, no, it's turn, all, like it's a whole all balanced. And so you're, you know, you're pulling it down, but, but when you're way up in the rafters of an amphitheater, yeah, you know, and, and you're really the far away. Now, so. Like I didn't tour with ACDC. I worked on local lighting crews when they would come through my yeah. area. And so you're way mm-hmm. up in the rafters and so the the spotlight gets smaller and smaller the further away it gets to you. And you're just trying to follow Angus around. And it's uh-huh. like now he's running through the crowd and the lighting guy's screaming in your ears, don't lose him, he's in the crowd. And then, yeah, of course, he's bound to rip his pants down. So you're like, well, uh-huh. you got to make sure that your lighting is bare ass. You have to make sure that you get it. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah running. When was this? Oh, in this the- mid-90s. That was that was their like probably like their their most liveliest peak though where he's like not like because he's still running around and he's not young anymore but then he was a little bit younger a little bit crazier yeah. probably so that was probably you know well the I peak started their, on uh, the I started on the radio in ninety eight so it was like ninety five ninety six ninety seven era when I was doing lighting and stuff okay yeah. That's awesome. That's cool. That's a good thing to have on the resume following him around. I'm sure you've done more artists than just him, though, but he might have been a more difficult one of them running yeah. around. And, and it's or a Bruce cool... Dickinson, maybe. He's very fast, too. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and he's got the flamethrowers, and there's... Yeah. I, Iron Maiden still to this day is kind of setting the bar. When you talk about 
amazing live shows. Oh uh, yeah. Iron Maiden is like a whole other level. It's like Iron Maiden, maybe maybe Ramstein now. They're doing very crazy stuff. But yeah, they're just uh I really enjoy seeing the the you uh no, is it Coldplay when they have all of the you know bracelets lighting up. I was like, hell yeah, that's such a good idea and it looks so cool. You gotta get to that level to be able to afford it though. I know, I know. Maybe another seven years or fourteen. <laughs> or, I don't know. Well, you alluded to the fact that the band is now at the point where you guys are starting to do these headlining shows, but in the early days of any band, you open up for other bands and you get, Mm -hmm. like you said, 20 minutes, 25 minutes to try and win over a crowd that isn't there to see you most likely. No, but that should be a good thing. You should go in with the uh, the mindset that that's a great thing because uh, that's what you're there for. Uh, like, you actually, like, uh, if you have your mindset to, like, I'm here to politely, uh, not steal, but, like, you know, gather uh, fans from other bands that are in a somewhat similar vein of music, you know, and hopefully you just go up there, fucking crush it. Hopefully you do a good job. Hopefully, uh, people out there in the in the crowd go, yeah, I like this band. I'll go on the next show. Maybe like you so much that they go buy a shirt from you, and then hopefully enough people do that to like at least sustain you throughout the grinding period, which is the first years. But like, there's no telling how long it will take. You just have to freaking do it, and you have to be good. <laughs> you have to write good music. But I'm sure you are. Whose fans were the hardest to win over? What tour was uh, the, like? Because there are there are stories about the early days of Metallica. Yeah where bands oh, yeah. wanted oh, yeah. that job, but also feared opening up for Metallica because the fans were so harsh. Whose fans were harsh for you guys to really win over? Um, That's, that's a tricky one. I feel like we've never really been booed. And I think that's that's good. That's that good. Feels good. Uh, I got a foot throw, uh, not foot, a shoe thrown on me once. Uh, but that was not because... We saw that was because we had like a that was actually pretty recently and I was very furious, but I hope I covered that up. Like, who's throwing shoes? I'm gonna find you and throw you out. I want to ban you forever. God damn. Um, yeah, no, I don't know. It's uh, um, it's become a thing where people have been recently and a lot of artists, not rock artists per se, have been commenting that people have been throwing things up on stage and. Yeah. Like Pink just had somebody throw a bag of their mom's cremated ashes on stage. And the video that is messed up. Right? And and people are like Adele was just on stage talking about it. Like, can everybody please stop throwing things on stage yeah. at the artist? Because like BB Rexa got hit in the eye with a phone yeah. and needed stitches. And Adele basically said in her evening gown in Vegas. If you throw something on the stage, I'll fucking kill you. And <laughs> <laughs> I like that though, because that's kind of like how I feel. I was like, man, just don't throw things at me. That's my only thing. I don't want to. I want to be nervous. I like. I want to be able to stand up here and close my eyes. Sometimes I actually play with my eyes closed. It's just one of the things I do. And it's like, if I, if something hits me, and if, that could be anything, a bottle or, and that's just gonna ruin my 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 performance for so many years to come. Just knowing like I'm gonna flinch for everything. And, and yeah, like I said, like this shoe hit me. That was like, I was standing and I was looking um, the other way. I was looking towards the drummer, like not at the crowd and just kind of, uh, and it was a very dark stage because we had a, a little bit of an issue. But that shoe hit me like, if I was turned the other way, I'd be smacked in my face. So like they, they hit really good. And I was like, that's how I was so furious. Like that could have been a real injury. Like it wasn't just something that touched my foot or like, and the, the disrespect of throwing something like, that's fine. I don't give a shit. Maybe we're drunk. Have fun. I don't care. But like, you hit me, man. <laughs> you hit me with your stinky shoe. And that, uh, I didn't like that. <laughs> and it's not hard to figure out who it was. Just stand outside and wait for the one asshole no, with one shoe on. I think I said that. I think like, if you find someone with one shoe, throw him out. <laughs> or we threw with the shoe away when he had to go barefoot home. I don't remember what we did. I was just like, uh, it was not a bad. It was the first time that happened. I hope it doesn't happen again. I've always wanted to ask a guitar player this, and so I'm glad you brought it up. What is it when you're playing and you're in the moment? Does it make it easier to close your eyes? Why do you close your eyes when you're playing? Like, are you seeing mm-hmm. the notes in your head? What What is it about that moment that you have to close no. your eyes? <laughs> no, that's probably just. Um, 
it's probably a very simple part but i don't really need to look at the guitar and i know how to play it uh first and foremost and then uh, i don't know if you've seen us live but usually like i uh i don't do much for facial expressions at all we do move and not we have our like you know our, our moments but like i don't i don't interfere much with the crowd if you know what i'm saying or like sing along much like i just i just there i'm deaf there <laughs> and sometimes i just rest my ass i just do the same thing but i close my eyes or it could be a moment um a lot of the times where i'm not playing at all and then i'm just kind of waiting for 20 seconds for a breakdown or anything like that and i just have like a post where i will stand and i just kind of have a 20 second little meditation where i just kind of put my hands down and i, I close my eyes and then i know when the cue comes in my ear and i just go at it again i don't know this feels good. Instead of rather standing there just watching people for like a minute, I just like, you know what? I'm going to close my eyes. I'm going <laughs> to hide in here for a second. Sometimes I end with people with masks, like Slipknot and, 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 and the sleep token and whatnot. Just like good. Just like no one knows where you're watching. No one, you're like, I'm just, that's why I don't do any faces, I guess. And it's, but and no. it's part of, you know, there, there's also this trend in rock music where people keep falling off the stage and it happens all the time. So the idea mm-hmm. of closing your eyes on that stage, there's a level of danger, too, because you're yeah. bound to have a, a spinal tap moment where something goes horribly wrong. And in a lot of cases, people are either falling on the stage or falling off the stage. Yeah. And then, like, it's, it, like I said, it could be very, sometimes it gets pitch dark in out there. So <laughs> it was actually one, and it can vary a little bit from venue to venue. And it was fun, one venue on the last tour where it got extremely dark after one song. And me and then, and Nick Fellow, my bassist, he had, we had just and the finished playing and we played on the, 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 the stage, what do you call it? The risers. The risers in the front. And then the song ends and it got dark. And we, I'm just like, I can't move. I can't go because I will fall if I go anywhere because it's so dark. So we had to like kind of wait for any light source. And I was just like, this looks so stupid. I feel like the whole venue is looking at me trying to get down from there. They probably but then, couldn't um, see you. <laughs> I know. I just probably couldn't see me. So it's fine. But then when a the little bit of light comes on, I look over and I see that Nick had the exact same issue. He was just waiting. It was like, okay, here it is. And we walked off and we was just like, that was dark. For music fans that have never been on a stage, a lot of time, especially when you're the headliner... Your crew goes out and like lines in like glow in the dark tape or fluorescent tape, like the front of the stage mm-hmm. and where things are, because even though there's hundreds of thousands of dollars of lights hanging above you, it gets yeah. really dark up there. And yeah. between and the, then we, the, we cater it dark. We want it dark. Yeah. That's the whole thing for us. It's so much cooler and dark. And, and then like a hardcore show, maybe you want a lot of light and just, you know, just but our show is catered to be very dark. So, and and I enjoy it better up there when it's dark. I feel more at home for sure. But like you said, yeah, they either do it with tape to make sure that we don't get injured. And we also have, they all have like flashlights. So every time that I move back, cause we, 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 we clear the stage a lot when we're not playing. Um, for instance, if I have a, you know, an interest that I don't play for a minute, I'll walk off. And then they're always very good at helping with the lights. So they always know when we're coming and then make sure that they, uh, uh, point their flashlight to where we're walking so we can see all the stairs and whatnot. And so it's, it's never been an issue, but yeah, we definitely have to be really careful because it's a big fall. If something goes wrong, if like, and you have any guitarist, like even though it's like I said, that's a Dave Grohl situation. If you see him falling down the stage in, in Sweden, it's oh. like, it's a big fall and he has he a guitar. Like 12 like, feet. You know, yeah, of course that's going to do something to your foot. So yeah, no, I really don't want that to happen. Can we talk about, the songwriting aspect of of you as a musician do you remember the first song you ever wrote oh man i I, not fully i remember silly ideas for sure in my head and then um i don't know if i have like the first song i ever wrote fully probably didn't get released you know what i'm saying in like a in like a real way and then, uh, so I remember them, but the first song is, I don't think we're good enough to ever get released. But then I've written some cool songs, like for my other band in Sweden, like way back that, uh, was pretty good. <laughs> I'm fascinated yeah, I, by was, the process of it because I can't do it. So yeah, no, how that's does good, it start the, for you? Is it lyric based? Is it melody based? Is it oh. riff based? It, it it could be anything and it all like it all depends on how often you do it i think it's straight up something that's in uh, like the ideas and all that stuff 
it's kind of in the ether. So you're not going to get tuned into that unless you sit down and try to for a, a lot of time. So that's when you sit down and nothing happens. You have writer's block and then you just you throw the guitar down and you don't give a fuck for a month. Like, don't do that. Like, you, it's uh, if you sit for another two hours, it might come. Like, or you need to have those four hours of nothing for shit to come eventually. So essentially, just the more you do it, um, the, the the more ideas you're going to hear and stuff. If you if you are, um, like I said, uh, wired that way. I don't know. Like, I feel I definitely feel like some people hear more things and like have a little bit easier just putting stuff together than others. Just like some people like. Uh, are more attuned to you know like uh connecting to freaking spirits and stuff like i've never seen a ghost in my entire life but i kind of do believe that there are some people that are way more sensitive to that Corey taylor from Uh, slipknot wrote a whole book about it oh yeah this see there you go and like i totally believe it and i never seen it like i'm one of those people that never seen anything out of the ordinary at all and I, I just totally believe in everything and I want. I like, you know, That's why you I love like those podcasts. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's why I love alien stuff. And like, I just like, like, you know, you know, who built the pyramids? I got to know kind of guy. I, uh, I always ask songwriters this question because it is such a subjective art form, but mm-hmm. at its core, songwriting is in fact a skill that is admired by other songwriters and other songwriters are always better at breaking down a song and explaining it so can you give me an example of a song from any artist any genre of music that you covet and you go oh that song is so perfectly written that i wish i wrote it but you gotta break it down and explain why you think it's perfectly written i mean you can go in and in, in terms of perfect flow with bridges chorus and whatnot but i don't really think that i think the perfect song is a song that you get emotionally involved with. Uh, something that you hear and then you either you get a little shiver down your spine or you just like you just feel like you fucking like it. Like a lot you listen to a lot of music. I'm one of those very picky picky people that a lot of it just breathes by like, yeah, that's nothing special to me, but something is special. I feel something. And uh uh so I don't know if I can break it down. Like a perfect song is Wonderwall by Oasis. I still, ever since I heard it as a child, I can still hear it. It's just so freaking good. Um, it's very simple, you know. Um, um, but uh, in terms of like, I, I don't know, breaking it down. The, just about why you think it's so perfectly written. Like what it is about uh-huh. the song that you think is so brilliant about it's for me crap. yeah okay so for me i'm a guy who always i like uh lyrics are very important and i know that it's just like growing up and even to this day the first pass through is non-lyrical to me it's only freaking audio information and and that needs to put me in a good place even if your lyrics are shit or great <laughs> so i'll listen to that later the first like uh, pass that i hear of it needs to like put me in like this freaking just sounds good audio wise even if i this was in a language that i don't understand and then i start listening to the lyrics and maybe like oh now we got some stuff to fix because these lyrics made the song worse <laughs> you know you can have those kind of problems or they can make the song even better uh but me uh, like like i said we, lyrics are very important in the end uh, as an end product but it starts always like with a vibe for me like a chord progression maybe with a, a verse melody uh, or something and then you build from there because that little section of maybe five five uh, seconds of uh, music can tell you what you need to go in this song you kind of like that the energy of freaking vibes that that music gives you that little five second that idea that you have will tell you where you need to go like oh this is gonna do that you know so um yeah, we usually start with just trying to get an idea going. Rather than have a riff, if we can just add a riff to some cool idea later. We always try to start with like a nice progression and a vocal uh, melody, and then we build from there. Because that's if the vocals ain't good, the song ain't good, even if it's a really good it's a song. You talk about like Wonderwall from Oasis, and every time I ask mm-hmm. songwriters that songwriting question about what makes brilliant songwriting, the word simplicity always comes up that the brilliance seems to be in the simplicity of the writing too yeah unless you know your favorite song is bleed (laughs) on the sugar 
<laughs> but it's kind of like the whole concept there is also pretty simple because it's just drony, right? It's just like very technical, so it's very difficult to play it. But the whole delivery of it is just kind of drony. You just come into a trance and then it's simple, right? You just and then and then and you just Gang go Van with Halen it. just came out in an interview recently and said that he loves to fall asleep to Meshuggah because of that. I understand. Yeah, exactly. It's just like a groove. It's very technical, and I cannot always follow where he puts the one and twos. But uh, uh, it's, yeah, it's very interesting. And it's always like when you start, when you just, you know, get into the rhythm sometimes for a few, he's like, this is so cool. And then you get lost again because it's just, you know, it's just the adventure of, of sounds. Being, They're very, very cool. Being a transplant, what are – similarities and what are differences between Sweden and the United States now that you've lived in both? <sighs> night and day, night and day. Really? Is, is it too different? Have you been to, you've been to Europe, no? Uh, I've been in to general. Europe, but not Sweden. Okay. I just kind of feels like Europe too. It's just one of those things, like when you land there, it feels like a different universe. The, the Atlantic is really like a little dimension port. Cause when you, when you like land in uh, like you take off from Heathrow in London and you land in, in you know, uh, in uh, New York or something. It's just completely different. The air is different and everything is different. But um, having lived there now for seven years, I wouldn't have it any other way. I really do love it here. It, it really is like a really good country for opportunities where you pave your own way in a really nice way. And then in the bubbling hot pot for like music in general, um, you know, there's so many cities here that is really uh, like we got Nashville, we got uh, LA, we got, you know, a lot of cool uh, music cities, New York, um, and then, no, I've, I've never, never regretted it. I really, really, truly enjoyed it. A lot of things to me make a lot more sense in Europe and Sweden, just by living standards, like, uh, the metric system, <laughs> you know, it's, uh, <laughs> always going to be a, a tough one for me. Cause I was every like, come on American, guys, you have to follow me on this way. You got to get on this boat. Every Everything American so has a sense. converter on their phone because <laughs> we know. can't convert the metric system. But I feel like I like uh, I, I I can agree. Like if you haven't learned, I mean, I, I I really can't because I can explain this to anyone in one minute. But um, I feel like it should be taught now. Like it should be just you know one hour every week metric system, and they will know because it's so simple. And then you can spend sixteen hours learning a very complicated system that doesn't make sense. Do whatever you want, whatever you want. But like. I want y'all's children to know the metric system. And Americans are so like, we're not learning the metric system, but when they talk <laughs> about bullets and alcohol, it's oh, metric. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, right. Oh, it's very it's it's very um it's interesting. But um yeah, it's um Sweden is a lovely country and I when I look back, it's like I, 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 it's all with all the love, and I never had a bad day at day at all. It's just like you know what I'm saying. I just wouldn't regret it. Obviously, like I, yeah. I went over here, I grinded with a new band, Battlements for you know forever. Got um, new best friends, and now we're doing good. So like I'm, I'm really on track of what what should have happened, you know. Yeah. And I'm very happy I, I took the leap because it was obviously like, hey, I'm gonna move. I'm just gonna ditch. Uh, this country go and like you know make music with people that are 10 years younger than me and uh you know <laughs> barely out of high school and uh, you know we are just but everybody's mind was on the same page everybody wanted to do it and that's really what it takes it can't just be one guy it needs to be like everybody knows what's what's the stake and what 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 it takes and uh it was fucking clear from day one everybody was very clear and very professional and you know so i think that's been playing in our favor as well we've just been out here you know I talked to Sharon Denadell about touring in the States and she's like, on this tour, we're doing, you know, the most American things we could think of. We went to a donut shop, we went to a shooting range and we went shopping for Halloween decorations. And I was like, <laughs> that's what foreigners think being American is. And she was like, they were all great. <laughs> yeah. The, yeah. The Halloween is crazy that there's stores open like, you know, year around <laughs> for just, you know, I guess Halloween and, and costume parties in general. I really like to dress up. It's the best America. day of the whole year as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. Halloween is awesome. Yeah, I know a lot of people. Yeah, that's uh, it's my singer's birthday. I think. That's the best birthday ever. The thing, the thing that's why I like I, that's the only birthday I remember because I'm really bad with dating. <laughs> See? <laughs> but if, you, if your birthday is on Christmas or something, I'll remember it. Yeah. <laughs> Um, before I let you go, I have to ask you this question because when we, mm -hmm. when we got connected today, you warned me that it would be possible that your cat might jump up on the table. So yes. when I interviewed Geezer Butler from Black Sabbath, 
we were talking about his pets and he let it slip that he had 13 cats and five dogs. And I asked him, how do you keep track of all of the names? And he said, it's easy. We name them all after gangster rappers. And I, once I stopped laughing, which took a minute, Oh God! he started listing off all of these names. And so now on the show, I call it the geezer Butler question because I'm fascinated by how musicians come up with the names for their pets. So hit me with it. Uh, I got two kittens. Uh, well, they're not kittens anymore, but they were like, my girlfriend found them or like, you know, they were in the shelter and took them in when they were small. So they like kind of stopped growing. So they're full size now, but they're kind of half size, you know. Uh, I named one Mayhem after the band Mayhem because she was kind of crazy. <laughs> so her name is Mayhem, but we say May May when she's, you know, nice. And then there was another who, uh, who, was, who was a girl. We named her Molly, but <laughs> turns out she had nuts. So we named her Momo. <laughs> it took a minute and then like oh that that new balls just dropped so uh <laughs> molly became momo <laughs> so it's it's mayhem and momo in here r- running around you said you're home and wilhelm <laughs> you said you're home taking a little bit of a break so so what's going on with the band for the rest of the year and the plans for 2024 songwriting new music touring what's going on <laughs> Oh, exactly. Yeah, we're home now and we're just uh, diving into songwriting. That's what we're doing. Um, kind of just treating it as a normal nine to five, honestly. Uh, Monday to Friday, we go and we write. And then, yeah, we're going on tour in uh, is it, uh, August, early September with uh, Era and I See Stars. And that's going to be an American one. And it's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, really looking forward to that one. And then I think we are, uh, I'm very bad at my schedule, but I think we're off for the rest of the year before we go out next year. I don't know how much it's announced. I'm so bad at like, maybe I'll say stuff I'm not allowed to say. That's but me, I think I'm that's fine. Me I think fishing we've announced for, everything. That's me Pretty fishing sure for info. I'm looking <laughs> yeah, for the scoop. I'm, and I don't have like, I don't think any of my team is here to, to filter, or uh, monitor me. So I, I don't know. <laughs> There's always that um, guy in the band with the loose lips. The one that yeah, always but, uh, let the stuff comes- slip. <laughs> Exactly. And, and and not wanting to either. But concerning this year, that's what we have. We have a lot of writing to do and we have that tour in, in America. So, uh, which it, it might be a few tickets left on someday. I, didn't, I haven't really seen the update, but it's been pretty tricky to get tickets. Uh, but I'm really excited to see everyone who managed to. Well, I really appreciate you taking the time on your day off to hang out with me and talk about your crazy cats and <laughs> about your guitar playing and all of that. So I, I really oh, yeah, appreciate you taking the time. Of course. Thank you. All right. Have a great day. Thank you so much. You as well. Okay, bye. There he is, Jolly from Bad Omens. The band's latest album, The Death of Peace of Mind, is available everywhere. And you can see him out on the road this fall, including a stop in Boston at Roadrunner on September 16th. Check the links in the show notes of this episode to get tickets. You'll also find the link to this episode's corresponding playlist, that features Bad Omens music and all the other artists and songs that Jolly and I referenced in the interview. You'll also find all of Jolly's links and all the links to find Bad Omens online and all the Mistress Carrie links as well. If you liked what you heard, don't forget to like, follow, and subscribe to the Mistress Carrie podcast. New full-length episodes come out every Wednesday. Plus, on the weekdays, you get the sit rep which breaks down all of your rock news, music headlines, and entertainment updates in about five minutes. And plus, you never know when we're going to release a bonus episode. You can join me live every Tuesday night at 8.30 Eastern on my official Facebook page for my video show, Cocktails in the War Room. And of course, you can always find me on the Mistress Carrie radio show. Get the details on all that and more at mistresscarrie.com. The Mistress Carrie Podcast, a proud member of the Pantheon Podcast Network. For America's climate goals, investing in clean energy adds up. But what doesn't add up is an additionality requirement for clean hydrogen. Additionality would put an unnecessary and inequitable burden on domestic clean hydrogen producers and have serious consequences for America. America needs clean hydrogen. But an additionality requirement just doesn't add up. Get the facts at cleanhydrogentoday.org. Paid for by the Fuel Cell and Hydrogen Energy Association.